Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Workshop Quick Takes. Thanks for joining us once again. Last time, we took another look at our 9701 Jeep Cherokee XJ, found some crushed automatic transmission cooler lines right underneath the passenger side engine mount where everything passes over the travel area for the right front control arm. Now, Chrysler did the right thing by putting cooler lines on this transmission. The AW4 can generate quite a bit of heat, especially during wheeling activities or whatever else. But Chrysler being Chrysler, they can never do one right thing without doing a couple wrong ones to compensate. So the location where those lines run, it should have been run up and over the engine mount. It would have been easy enough for them to do it. Why didn't they do it? Well, again, they're Chrysler. <laughs> you might go replacing all those lines, have the exact same thing happen again. And now you're asking yourself, okay, I'm not paying all those prices twice. What can I do? Well, you can do a hose modification. We're going to show you what we think is a very safe and secure way to do it. These are hydraulic lines, but they're a cooling loop, not a work loop. They operate within the range of a garden hose. You can safely splice garden hoses and things like that. So let's go take a look at what we're going to do, but just make sure that if you try to replicate this, that you are working within your own safety and comfort zone. About a month after making our initial OEM repair of the transmission cooler lines, we were leading a five-vehicle caravan up a four-wheel drive trail in the Colorado Rockies, which of course is where one goes with a Jeep, and enjoying the smells of things like fir trees and home-baked chocolate chip cookies. As we returned down the trail at the end of the day, however, the more pleasant odors of the journey were increasingly replaced with the smell of distilled dead dinosaur juice roasting on the cast iron surfaces of an AMC 242 inline 6. Now, when you own an old Jeep, you become somewhat ambivalent to odors of that type, but when we returned to paved roads and stopped to verify that the full caravan had descended safely and everyone was then ready to split up, I became aware of a slow but steady dripping of ATF from somewhere just behind the radiator. Popping the hood revealed it was emanating from somewhere near the cooling return line's midsection disconnect by the harmonic balancer. The mechanical fan was then converting it to fine droplets and sharing them with the full engine compartment. I thought perhaps the disconnect fitting wasn't making a tight seal, but couldn't be sure since the sunlight was fading and my blood oxygen levels hadn't fully recovered from spending the day at 12,000 feet elevation. The ATF dipstick said our levels were still fine, so we decided to chance the drive and did make it home without requiring a flatbed wrecker or a roadside repair. In good light the next day, I inspected the damage and our story continues from there. Upon inspection, the first thing we noticed is the rubber hose section at the harmonic balancer had developed fatal attraction to said balancer. The balancer in turn had been slowly grinding through the hose for most of our return trip down the mountain and had cut far enough into it to produce a slow but steady leak. But since we were in no position to pull the hose and go further that day, on a hunch we went back to our favorite supplier, that would be Napa Auto Parts, and ordered a quick connect hose section in place of a complete two-piece return line. This time the part number was 765-1209. We briefly showed it in our first video but didn't explain why we had it. Now you're about to find out. Would you look at that? It's not really going to save a lot of money. But depending on what I have to do, I might be able to save a little bit by not having to completely strip out one of those lines. It's the quick connect. And look, an empty hose piece on the Okay, next thing I need to decide here is how long I'm going to cut this. I got plenty of hose on the back end here, but I would like to have a little bit more slack. So I want this to come up maybe over here so I can move it forward quite a bit and then have it come back here. So I think maybe I won't cut this one at all. And then this one, this one right in there, that'll uh, move things down and over quite a bit, which should be helpful. To mimic the following, you will also need a 3 8 inch by 3 8 inch brass hose barb coupler, a pair of hose clamps in that same size range, and oil resistant RTV adhesive. For this project, we're sticking with Permatex Ultra Black, not because they pay us, but because we pay them. It's just that good. Okay, here goes nothing. Hmm. Well, I may need a little bit of a catch basin here. I think that's more than I can catch with a paper towel. Okay, let's try that again. Besides being bad for the environment, 
ATF is fantastic for staining both concrete and asphalt surfaces that aren't otherwise epoxy sealed. Even when weathering in open sunlight, a few spots on the driveway will take months to disappear, and that's after using a commercial strength degreaser. Best to have your catch pans and towels ready. Good start. And now, for the cut line. Oh, well, let's just start here and see how that looks. That'll work. That's the nastiest pumpkin I've ever seen. That should be plenty, and I've left the outer end of the nipple there free, so I don't mess that up. adjust this up a bit because the other thing I don't want to happen is for this to get hit by the sway bar. Okay, now hopefully that stays out of the way of both the pulley and the sway bar. And in any case, if it hits it, it's just going to do that. Okay, so that's one way of dealing with a failure mode in these cooler lines. You can also perform a similar splice to avoid disconnecting the quick connect line at the lower radiator feed, provided the quick connect is not already leaking ATF from old O-ring seals. However, when a failure of this kind occurs after a month of flawless operation, it may not have been bad assembly on your part. Inspect the entire line end to end and look for a root cause. Well, for better or worse, I don't feel quite as stupid now because after following the path of destruction, I figured out what happened. In spite of the fact that I thought I had plenty of clearance, I must have flexed enough on the trail that this here came all the way up and hit this. And when that did, it pulled that line forward, both of these, which is what actually pulled the hose into the pulley. So even though, you know, factory-wise, it's not a great setup, it was back in the, all the factory locations and it still managed to get hung up on the uh, bar there. So I don't know if that means I need a new firmer bump stop up here inside the spring or what the deal is, but it was going to do that regardless of how I'd mounted this. But I'm still not 100% sure what to do about here because one of those lines is bent enough that it's almost completely cut off the flow to the uh, transmission cooler. So I've uh, got the leak sealed up at least so I can drive this on the road again. Well, it's now happened a second time, and I'm done with that. In fact, when that happened, it was on a four-wheel drive trail, nothing unusual, and I have my sway bar attached, so it's not like it was over-flexing, and then started leaking out. But thankfully, it had already crimped them so much back there that it wasn't leaking very fast, so um, make up your mind what that means. So it's time to reroute those lines. Now here's how I'm gonna do it. This is a piece of 3 8 copper line, and it is the same diameter as this, from what I could tell, both of my calipers and just looking at it. So I am going to have to cut this off and apply some compression fittings in line and then reroute a longer section of tube around this trouble area. And then hopefully that finally deals with it. One other thing I noticed up here is that last time I replaced that fitting and it's in great shape. It's holding up nice. This fitting that I reused and plugged back into, oh, it's seeping. So I might as well go ahead and replace that too. It was only 12 bucks and it's not that hard to get to. These are brass compression to compression fittings for 3 8 Now I'm not using polyethylene tube or something like that, so I don't need these inner pieces. Actually, we don't need any of these pieces. This is not the right way to repair your cooler lines, and we spent the better part of two hours and a not inconsequential sum of money learning why.
Yeah, that looks pretty, but this new solution didn't survive a single test start of the engine with an Evernoble AW4 in the park position. Spewing out from both of the connections. Ironically, the compression connections to the existing line were solid, but it was leaking like a sieve from the interface to the new copper line segments. But then, even if we had the foresight to make this work by saving the old damage line and then cutting sections out of them instead of buying the copper tube, it still would not have worked. Let's use the awesome power of hindsight to analyze this here situation. Inline copper compression type fittings like these are great when you're just making a connection between a too short section of line that runs to your refrigerator's ice maker accessory, or possibly the break room coffee maker at the office. But they're not meant for automotive duty. Even if we had gotten this layout working flawlessly today, it probably would have failed in a couple months after another wheeling trip or five. And then you, our loyal viewers, would have been subjected to the horrors of a part three in this series. So let's skip over that and see what really worked. You do need to cut your busted cooler line or lines in order to perform a workable fix. And there it is. So, in case you're not familiar with the benefits of a circular pipe cutter, let's take a quick look at why you should have two or three of those and how they work. Because they do come in a few different sizes and the size may determine whether or not it even fits. This here is a nice large size, very heavy duty, works great on larger pipes like half, three quarter, one inch. However, you do need space to be able to rotate this whole thing, so consider that carefully before picking something this size. Also, this has the largest pipe reaming tool. This here will obviously ream anything about half inch or larger, but it's certainly not going to do much for you on this. Here's a smaller size, also has a reaming tool. This here is much more like what we need. That there just cleans any burrs off the end. However, that too is too large to work within the space underneath the Jeep, which is what we need to do today. So you're probably going to want to have something like this. This does not have the reaming tool on it, so you're going to want either one of these other sizes, or if you need an easy substitute, a needle nose pliers will also act as a crude reaming tool. You just don't want to overdo this because you do need to fit it through that brass fitting or whatever else you're working on. Regardless of the application, whether you're doing home plumbing projects or whether you're trying to fix your Jeep, these are good tools to have. The way to use one of these tools is you want to get your pipe right in here between these two lower wheels, so adjust accordingly, and then apply light tension. Again, light tension. You're not trying to cut through this whole thing in a single pass, but you do want to be able to turn it freely. And what you'll notice is, ha, ah, there's starting to be a line forming on there. And yeah, it's crimping in a little bit, but as long as you only go fractions of a turn with each pass, once it starts to loosen up again, tighten it, turn it again a couple times. Once it starts to loosen up, turn it. And again, be patient because if you're not patient, you're going to crimp the line way in and then have to spend a bunch of time reaming it out and probably creating metal filings besides, which are the last thing you want in your cooler lines. And just like that, we have a nice clean break. And if we have to, we can come back and ream that out slightly. But most importantly, unlike using a saw, we didn't just fill up our lines with metal filings because that would be bad. Okay, we're going to the hack way of doing it. This is 3 8 inner diameter transmission cooler line hose. These are fuel injection style clamps. They can apply a really nice pressure. And this is Permatex Black. I'm going to put some Permatex Black on the hoses that I've now cut off again on, this, on the steel lines. Then slide this over it. And then make sure there's two clamps on each side so that it can't just pull loose. So the Permatex Black should glue and seal it and the clamp should make sure. Hope it works this time. Under here, all the way now back to where we were two hours ago. So, hoping it working this time. Well, that particular day got away from me, as did my remaining camera battery life and storage space. So, I thought maybe it would be better to show it here on the workbench using a clear tube so you can see what the objective is. So, let's suppose this here is the end that we have just cut off. Oh, and by the way, these ends here. Until you actually ream them out, they can be extremely sharp. And no, this band-aid is not a prop. So you do generally do want to ream the pipe just a little bit. And then if possible, take something light that won't harm the transmission system like WD-40. 
Jam the straw past the area that you're trying to uh, clean. Spray some lubricant up in there and then let it run back out and it will carry out any remaining metal filings that you just created. Here's how we're going to apply the Permatex adhesive. We don't want to apply it at the end because if any balls that dry and break off in the system could run back and clog. So I'm going to start a little bit upstream from that and then just get a generous portion on here. Any extra that comes out will be at the end of the pipe after we put the pipe on and shouldn't be an issue. Now ideally, do this when you are absolutely certain you're at the last step and don't have to disconnect anything again because again, if you'd have to pull that pipe back off, some of that's possibly going to go in there and then end up in your transmission system. So now what's happening is, you're pushing the hose on and when it gets to the adhesive, you'll notice it lubricates it significantly and it gets a lot easier to put on. That there is what we're creating. You won't be able to see that through the black uh, transmission line cooler hose, but that's what's happening inside there. And then, just clean off the excess. Give it a couple minutes to start pre-curing if you like. Okay, then when you're ready, you're gonna need your fuel injection hose clamps. I'm pretty sure you can buy these at just about any auto parts store. These particular ones came from Advanced Auto Parts. But let's take a look at them real quick and see why they're different than standard hose clamps. Because Okay, here is a standard hose clamp. It has the little worm gear operator, and you can see that it's just kind of folded metal together. All these parts and pieces that you see on here can actually cause physical damage to the hose, and on things like radiator hoses and general purpose vacuum lines and things like that, not a problem. On high pressure lines where the fluid coming out could catch fire and wipe out your car, you might want to think about it a little bit more. Here is the fuel injection clamp. At the small size here, notice that this over band across the top just uh, slides underneath around there so that the whole thing is shielded. But on these smaller ones, I particularly like this screw mechanism because unlike this worm gear screw here, which is not super secure and can actually pop off on some circumstances if it's over torqued, this here, pretty tight, not going anywhere. The final step we're going for is this. I want two of these, not quite next to each other, but also with some pipe hanging out over the end. So you'll be, you need to feel where the pipe ends inside the hose and set one of these maybe about there. Now this size here, I'm not sure if it's actually going to tighten up on this hose because this, this hose here has a smaller outer diameter than the actual correct stuff. But that's the idea. You want to get one of them on there right there. The second one, you then want about the same distance from the end of your hose on the pipe. So when that one's tightened down, you're going to have two clamps firmly secured that have to fail in order for this thing to pull off, and there's going to be a glue effect from the adhesive curing in here. So this is a way that you can attempt on a modest pressure line. Again, we're under 100 PSI here. So even though we don't have a barb on here or a bead roll on the end to help prevent the hose from slipping off, it would take an awful lot to blow it apart if you do it right. Well, it's easy to get carried away overthinking an idea, and this seems to have been one of those times because here's our final solution, and it went together very easily. So hopefully it turns out to be reliable. First up, to get that other transmission line fitting replaced, so that's taken care of. Now we got two new ones, two new seals, the whole bit. Coming back here, yes, we've now got hose over the line, and I've got two fuel injection clamps. They go down really tight. I've also got Permatex Black oil-resistant RTV underneath. And then there is split loom tubing over there just to prevent chafing where it goes up under there, but that can actually duck and weave around the area where the control arm interference has been occurring. And that on this side, I've tried to reroute the other line so that it's not going to uh, get kicked by the control arm anymore. And I'll go ahead and flex the vehicle here before I'm done just to make sure. But then coming back out here, you can see that I've got that extension plate. And I think that it was actually something good to come out of this. It gets the lines a little bit out of the way where they need to be rather than where they were. And then, yeah, two more of those fuel injection type clamps and black RTV on the line and we're good to go. So hopefully that solves the problem. Hey everyone, hope you found that helpful. What we just showed you there today, that's the condition that the Cherokee parked out back was left in when we're done. And so far, it's gone a few hundred miles and some wheeling trips since then without any issues whatsoever. So I think the problem's solved and we probably won't be going back to the OE setup. Even though in between the first video and this one, we actually did the spring replacement and the bump stops. Those are two other videos you can see on this channel. So hopefully the hardware upgrade solved the actual underlying problem, but Nonetheless, we went ahead and fixed it with the alternative solution, and if that fails, it's easy enough and cheap enough to fix it that way again. Hope you found that helpful. We'll see you again next time, whenever that is. Has anyone seen my phone?